I'm speaking uh, roughly uh, to a uh, draft programme, Communist Party, the Great Britain draft programme, sections 4.3 and 5, uh, which are in uh, pages 43 to 49. Uh, but I say roughly to those because I'm not going to be tied tie myself to, to exactly what uh, the party has agreed as the draft programme position on this question. I'm also speaking to um, a number of articles which I have written um, in uh, relation to uh, an exchange with uh, Paul Cockshot uh, in 2010, animated by my revolutionary strategy text, um, and uh, in relation to uh, a series of articles I wrote called Thinking the Alternative about why we should think about the maximum program and not merely the minimum program, let alone a quote transitional program. Um, and uh, the to and fro that I had with uh, Nick Rogers in when we were in left unity between socialist platform and communist platform around exactly the same, broadly speaking, the same issue. Um, going to our text at page uh, 47 of the draft program, we say, socialism is not a mode of production. It is the transition from capitalism to communism. Socialism is communism which emerges from capitalist society. It begins as capitalism with a worker's state. Socialism therefore bears the moral, economic and intellectual imprint of capitalism. In general, socialism is defined as the rule of the working class. The division of labor cannot be abolished overnight. It manifests itself under socialism in the contradictions between mental and manual labor, town and country, men and women, as well as social, regional and national differences. Uh, classes and social strata exist under socialism because of different positions occupied in relationship to the means of production, the roles played in society and the way they receive their income. Classes and social contradictions necessitate the continuation of the class struggle. However, this state struggle is reshaped by the overthrow of the capitalist state and the transition towards communism. Okay, so what we need to think about, uh, it seems to me, we need to think about the nature of communism in order to think about the nature of capital of, of the transition. And we need to think about the ways in which communism, not just socialism, but communism grows out of uh, uh, the dynamics of capitalist society. And um, I'm going to take a sidestep for a moment the very first article I ever wrote for the Weekly Worker was a review in 2002 of uh, Stephen Jay Gould's uh, Structure of Evolutionary Theory. Uh, it's uh, unfortunately the uh, uh, page on the website is uh, trashed and has, has lost all the paragraphing. Uh, so it's not so easy to uh, find. Uh, but in essence, the argument I took uh, priced in that thing is that we have to think about doing Marxism uh, in the way in which Jay Gould argues for doing Darwinism. That is to say that we're not engaged in treating the original texts that Karl Marx wrote as sacred texts. That's our fortiori because some of them, say for example, the German ideology is actually uh, put together by D.B. Ryazanov uh, uh, out of a number of different manuscripts, which turn out to have been uh, draft manuscripts submitted for a periodical, uh, a proposed periodical, which never found its way into print. Um, but equally, there's a load of stuff which is, um, how much should we how much account should we take of the early drafts of the civil war in France as opposed to the published version of the civil war in France 
how much account should we take of the drafts which lead up to capital when they appear to be in contradiction with uh, the uh, text which Marx actually published uh, in uh, Capital One and uh, the second edition of Capital One and the French edition of Capital One, which was the last one which he wrote uh, in his lifetime. But leave aside those textual problems about using uh, Marx's work as uh, Marx's work or Marx and Engels' work as sacred texts. Jay Gould argues that that's a really wrong way of doing, approaching science. If we're doing Darwinism, the way to approach Darwinism is not to treat what Darwin wrote in the 19th century as sacred texts, nor is it to do what he calls, and I think it's a really useful expression, citation grazing. Uh, for quotes from here or quotes from there as uh, proof texts for particular arguments, but rather to look at the underlying structure of the logical logic of the argument and to throw out, be willing to throw out stuff which is merely 19th century polemic or merely what was believed in the 19th century insofar as it isn't essential to the logical structure of the argument, but then to think on the basis of the logical structure of the argument, uh, where do we go from here? How does that relate to uh, the course of events, the information, the evidence, which has been produced in the uh, century since, uh, century and a half since Darwin wrote, which is also now century and a half since, uh, 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 since Marx was writing, and a century and a bit, century and 30 years since uh, Engels was writing. Um, I should add that part of doing that is also reject out of hand from the first, at the outset, the line of argument, which is very popular in the academy and in the new left, that Engels vulgarized Marx. Uh, which is demonstrated by uh, Sebastiano Timpanaro, and uh, Hal Draper, that that line of argument is completely inconsistent with uh, Marxist and Engels' methods of work uh, and the way in which the, the work was done. And that one of the particularly scandalous products of this, which is important in my view to our vision of the future, is the text called The Anti-During, uh, which is actually attributed to Engels, but is in reality for practical purposes co-authored by Marx. There's we, some parts of it which we actually have Marx's manuscript of the economics contained in the anti-during. Uh, there's other parts where it's just obvious from the style that Marx is uh, uh, engaged in, uh, co that this is a co-authorship, that the, the whole thing was seen as it came out in installments in the Volkstadt newspaper, uh, was uh, read by both of them before it, any part of it was published. Uh, so then what's this got to do with now, this issue? Uh, first off, uh, against the uh, critique of the Gotha program model, the critique of the Gotha program model, uh, which uh, is re relates to Marx's um, rough notes polemic against the draft Gotha program uh, in 1875, which was uh, sent as a uh, in a letter um, to uh, like I to to to. to uh, Babel and Liebknecht, I think it is, um, in any case, was sent as a letter, uh, as in a covering letter. And um, in that model, uh, there's a first stage of socialism, which is characterized by the continuation of bourgeois law. Uh, but at the same time, everybody is a uh, proletarian. There's nobody, there's no classes have got, uh, uh, gone, classes are gone, but the uh, distribution system remains a distribution on the basis of from each according to their activity to each according to their work. So it's a uh, labor tokens system forms the first stage and that labor tokens system uh, incentivizes uh, further development because it incentivizes uh, 
putting more work it makes it makes it advantageous for people to put more work in to work more hours uh and to work harder and so on uh in the same way that money does only it just doesn't do it in quite the same way as money because the labor tokens are only a claim on the state uh and not uh in theory not tradable whether they would actually be not tradable is another question altogether um so uh, not the not because I'm I, I because we're not uh, saying doing uh, sacred texts, the critique of the Gotha program and its first stage of socialism is not a sacred requirement. Mm -hmm. Equally, however, not uh, socialist Soviet quote Soviet socialism, uh, which allegedly has no classes, in spite of the fact that. Uh, in reality, the bureaucracy uh, has uh, very substantial, really substantial consumption privileges, that there is a sharp distinction between the peasantry and the proletariat, that there is a sharp distinction that there is, in fact, class discrimination in Soviet Union in the higher education system in favor of proletarians and against the children of the intelligentsia, so that we have to suppose that the intelligentsia is indeed a class. Uh, so on the one hand claims that there are no classes but on the other hand the state has become enormously powerful the state is not only continues as a powerful state but is a uh, a byzantine state or a german absolutist state which attempts to regulate everything uh, uh, and uh, is uh, at the end of the day as has as its spinal core a totally unaccountable police force uh, the kgb uh, nor, thirdly, uh, Trotsky's model. Now, where Trotsky's model, as I understand it, come from, uh, is that uh, in the um, 1907 version of uh, the Permanent Revolution in the text Results and Prospects, Trotsky argues that the proletariat can take power as a result of the combination of proletarian revolution and peasant revolution in Russia, but it cannot hold power unless there's an immediate spread, very short term spread of the Russian revolution to Western Europe. And the reason why it can't is because the interests of the peasantry are antagonistic to those of the proletariat. Mm -hmm. And then the consequence is that as soon as the proletariat implements the minimum program, the eight hour day, and so on and so forth, uh, the peasantry will move to overthrow the proletarian regime. The peasantry will do that because uh, the peasantry as a class employs labor. It's not, it's not, it's not it, it, if we think about farmers, it's uh, self-sufficiency farmers routinely employ labor in the harvest uh, at harvest time and so on and so forth so it's it's the idea that the peasantry the, the peasantry in reality as a class exploits also uh the unpaid labor of the uh, the peasant's wife and the peasant's children uh and this is in fact also true of the classical petty bourgeoisie i used to have a student who was child of asian shopkeepers and uh, uh was periodically unable to attend class because her father insisted on her uh, doing a shift in the shop during the time when she was supposed to be in class. Um, the, uh, then the consequence is that the working class simply imposing general rules about minimum wages and maximum hours places itself in conflict with the peasantry. Okay, so the problem with the uh, Trotsky defending that position in the 1920s when he was attacked as being a Menshevik and uh, uh, um, uh, all of that stuff uh, is that uh, he's saying that the peasant, the famous Smichka, the alliance of the proletariat and peasantry won't work. And in consequence, he rewrites. Um, he was, in fact, one of the first people to say that you could do um, economic development in isolation. Mm -hmm. But after the, in the fight in 1923 and after the fight in 1923, he rewrites his uh, conception. So instead of saying that the Soviet Union is bound to fall, which was undoubtedly the position, was the, was the position of the Mensheviks and the position of uh, 
Katsky, after the initial polemic, was that the Soviet Union was bound to fall because the relationship of forces, underlying relationship of forces in, in Russia would reassert itself. Um, instead, says, no, we can have the dictatorship of the proletariat. We can't have socialism in a single country, but we can have the dictatorship of the proletariat in a single country. And in order to defend that position, there's two sides to it, one of which is it becomes necessary to suppress everything which he'd said about the class interests of the peasantry, leading it to oppose uh, the rule of the working class. The second is that he has to re re redefine socialism from the common use in the left wing of the Second International to use socialism as a uh, meaning of the process procedure at form of transition and we are using we use in our draft program we use socialism in that sense of the sense in the second international of the form of transition though we also use it in relation to reactionary forms of socialism of one sort or another which we've been talking about the rest of this weekend yeah um but uh, trotsky then redefined socialism as what would otherwise be called communism that is to say, the full, fully developed uh, new mode of production, which has developed after the period of transition. Um, and um, <clears throat> that is uh, then becomes uh, the basis of it's being possible to say that uh, right, the Soviet Union is a worker state, but it's a generated worker state. It's still interest of the class. Um, it's no longer, we no longer think of it as being an immediate transition to socialism. There's a trans, it's post capitalist, uh, but not perhaps in transition beyond that. And uh, the working class could take over again by a, uh, an equivalent of 1688 or 1830, um, uh, it, 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 which, which gets characterized as political revolution. Mm -hmm um a coup d'etat um and certainly trotsky thinks envisages the possibility of a coup d'etat arising from within the regime arising from within the red army as and, and uh, overthrowing uh, the stalinist regime okay so Therefore, I, all of these things are things which I'm not saying it's absolutely wrong. I'm saying that uh, we are not committed to it because we're not committed to sacred texts, whether those sacred texts are sacred texts of Marx and Engels or sacred texts of Lenin and Trotsky. Mm -hmm. If we think about the logic of Marxism and the evidence of history, the conclusion which unavoidably arises is that there is necessarily a more or less prolonged period of transition between capitalism and communism. And that prolonged period of transition does involve the continued existence of classes. And the reason why this, we, we should think about it, in the first place, the evidence of history, uh, it, 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 the uh, capitalism didn't spring into existence fully formed and without feudal survivals of one sort or another uh, in the uh, early 17th century Netherlands or in the uh, year after the year 1688. There's an astonishingly rapid development after the year 1688 in England, explosive development. Uh, combination comment, comment has been made by Tim Harris that somebody who uh, a Rip Van Winkle who went to sleep in 1637 and woke up in 1667 would think that not much had changed but a Rip Van Winkle who went to sleep in 1687 and woke up in uh, 1717 would think that it, science fiction that it would be totally different radically different worlds so it's astonishingly rapid development but it's still the case that, for example, in Cumbria, uh, uh, it, battles are being fought about feudal exactions uh, and uh, all through the north of the country, battles are being fought about feudal exactions between landlords and tenants uh, and uh, the full monetization of the economy has not uh, not developed. And the same is true in France uh, in the 19th century, that uh, the, in quite late 19th century, there are sections of uh, 
rural France, which is still governed by uh, self, uh, non-market dependent uh, peasant relations of production. Uh, so on the basis equally of the, 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 the transition from antiquity to feudalism, we should not imagine that history does not lead us to suppose that there can be a sort of bang once it's all gone. Secondly, actually, we've done the experiment uh, with forced collectivization uh, in uh, forced collectivization and the five year plan forced march uh, in Russia. And it didn't bloody work. And indeed, forced collectivization is, which is the core of the issue, forced collectivization turned out to be an absolute disaster, utterly seriously damaged Soviet agriculture with results which are actually still with us in Russian agriculture, uh, that to the extent Russian agriculture is being revived, it's being revived by Chinese and Korean immigrants primarily, uh, rather than uh, by uh, the uh, Russian rural classes. Uh, and we've seen exactly the same thing. Uh, uh, David Priestland, I think, uh, made the point that uh, the arguments at the first five year plan are actually different from those of uh, Mao's Great Leap Forward, only in that the uh, arguments of being made in the Soviet regime at the time of the first five year plan are slightly less mad but they're not much less mad. They're as much uh, voluntarist, um, uh, uh, adventurism on the basis of the idea of the Hegelian leap uh, being translated into, we can overcome the uh, dynamics of uh, the economy. Um, and, Actually, it's not just Ch Russia and China. It's also the case, albeit less severely, that there's been uh, episodes of uh, zigzag between uh, voluntarism and uh, Bukharinist gradualism uh, in um, Cuba and in Vietnam uh, as, as well. And of course, the most extreme case is uh, Pol Pot, the uh, 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 year zero in uh, Cambridge. Mm -hmm. So that the idea of uh, generalized expropriation of the petty bourgeoisie of the petty proprietors in the instant, in the in the very short term turns out to be a really bad idea. And the consequence of that is that we have to expect that there is going to be a more or less prolonged period of transition, which is also a period of class struggle. And this is going back to um, uh, Mark Mulholland's point, the dictatorship of the proletariat has a real meaning, which is a meaning about which is about the proletariat mobilizing to intimidate uh, the state bureaucracy, the elected representatives to intimidate the rival classes uh, against um, uh, 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 their choices. Okay, so this is a, a period of transition, and it's a period of transition in which uh, classes continue to exist. Mm -hmm. But in order to think more about this period of transition, what's the there is a there there is capitalist logics still persisting within it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the wage and exploitation and so on continuing to persist within it. Mm. But there's also new logics of communism developing within it. Mm. Again, I did this, this idea of a, a contradictory and struggle filled, this is not original uh, and it goes back to Preobrazhensky. Uh, writing in the 1920s, though Preobrazhensky's conclusions are quite problematic, uh, and Hillel Tiktin uh, at various points uh, in uh, writing in the 1970s and 80s. Um, what are the logics of communism? The start it has to be, uh, how, or more exactly, how do the logics of communism grow out of 
at the problems, the present problems of capitalism. Because it would be you if we, if we were to just say we're going to have communism and it's all beautiful and it's uh, 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 an abstract construction, it's uh, that's 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 unproductive and unhelpful. Mm -hmm. First off, mm -hmm. communism is a system of production uh, for human need. It starts with the idea of production for need, from each according to their ability to each according to their need. It's not a slogan original to Marx, I guess Flora Tristan or somebody else in the 1840s uh, came up with it. Um, we've already got that. We are trying to defend the National Health Service, which is designed to provide health care according to need. It's not according to a rule of strict equality. We don't provide uh, equal doses of penicillin for everybody in the country. Uh, that wouldn't be a useful or sensible way of distributing healthcare. In fact, it's bloody stupid when we provide regular doses of penicillin to all the dairy cows in the country, which is uh, uh, thereby reduces the effectiveness of antibiotics. Um, equally, we provide education according to need. We don't, uh, we, we, it's true that you can buy education, my parents bought education with the considerable degree assistance of the UK state, uh, because my father was an army officer, so I was pay, they paid, they were paid for me to go to school. Yeah. But at the same time, well, our provision of public education and our uh, uh, provision of uh, 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 education and training places and so on and so forth is designed on the basis of needs and indeed the capitalists themselves are now talking about uh, very belatedly we desperately need to expand the number of places at medical schools uh, and uh, nursing colleges because uh, half of the problem with the nhs uh, not hold the heart by any means the whole of the problem with the nhs but a significant chunk of the problem with the nhs is that the uh, squeeze on the very expensive medical training uh, as for the sake of austerity and so on and so forth has resulted in uh, the NHS becoming dependent on importing doctors and nurses from uh, uh, other countries, uh, and then Brexit has reduced the willingness of people to come to this national chauvinist uh, 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 isolation, isolated uh, world, especially given that you're also your your wages are squeezed and you could earn better elsewhere. So. We can also reflect that with the disability assistance, that we have rules now which require us to make reasonable uh, adaptations uh, for people's disabilities. And uh, all around where I um, have been working uh, for the last, uh, God, uh, 22 years, uh, people are putting ramps in so that uh, wheelchair, to make wheelchair access available. Um, uh, uh, I'm about to provide, a. am giving a lecture on Tuesday and I'm about to provide a lecture handout in word format so that the student who has a sight issue um, uh, can enlarge it um, rather as opposed to getting a paper handout and so on and so forth. Um, we make these, these are provision in relation to need. And there's a whole raft of other stuff which we de decide similarly. Um, the uh, peculiar fatuity of the uh, government's attempt to face down the rail unions. Uh, God knows what. There's going to be some sort of deal at the end of it, uh, which may not be as good a deal as we would hope it would be. But uh, there will be a deal. The idea that uh, HM government could wholly shut down the railway links into London and uh, the uh, guys from the city would spend three hours a, a day each way sitting in traffic jams trying to get to central London because the uh, rail links into central London have been shut down in order to spite the rail workers is fatuous so the existence of the rail workers rail stuff is uh, 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 need-based decision making it's there persistently secondly Marx again from critique of the Gotha program labor is life's prime want 
labor is not mainly a means of subsistence, but life's prime want. The world which we live in is one in which there is enormous mass unemployment, fantastic levels of mass unemployment, particularly in third world countries, in uh, the colonial world, uh, uh, but also actually in uh, the um, uh, imperialist centers. And in the imperialist centers at the same time, vast masses of what David Graeber helpfully called bullshit jobs, uh, where there are jobs which are created solely for the purpose of job job creation, massive numbers of administrative jobs of one sort and another, which cycle stuff round. Um, one of my daughters um, funded her master's studies as a master's student by working part time uh, in the housing benefit office of uh, local council. And the regime essentially is that the only people, the uh, Conservative government um, under Thatcher and Major uh, created a requirement that public sector housing must charge market rents. But the only people who are in, eligible to have public sector housing under the new regime of the Thatcher and Major governments are people who cannot afford to pay market rents. The consequence of this market rents provision uh, is uh, more generally uh, that uh, by uh, going over to uh, abolishing rent control and paying market rents, 23% uh, of the adult benefit bill, 17 billion pounds a year, is paid out to private landlords uh, in uh, rents, in uh, state benefits for covering rents, housing benefit. Mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the idea, again, the idea of actually having the market going and abolishing all forms of public sector housing and uh, uh, abolishing all forms of control and so on is unacceptable to the capitalist class. My daughter was employed in the Housing Benefits Office. There was a whole raft of other people who were employed in the uh, Rent Collection Office. Mm -hmm. So that uh, each local council has a bunch of people who are employed in the Rent Collection Office and a bunch of people who are employed in the Housing Benefits Office circulating money from one office to the other office uh, in order to protect, create the pretense uh, that uh, market rents are being charged and that it's a market uh, arrangement. There's a whole load of bureau bureaucratic arrangements, fake fake market bureaucratic arrangements of one sort and another uh, uh, in a large, very large number of um, uh, uh, businesses and so on. Why doesn't the mass unemployment result in Malthusian population crash and uh, masses of people starving? The answer is because, in reality, the productivity of labor has risen so sharply uh, since the 1890s, so radically has the productivity of labor risen, uh, that, uh, and the productivity of agriculture, that the world has no difficulty, except in so far as there's uh, uh, economic disruption of, uh, of feeding the whole population of the world. So you've got this enormous population, massive unemployment, uh, and people aren't dying because the, uh, the, 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 the problem is a Malthusian uh, 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 population crunch. Yeah. Rather, people are just left on the scrap heap um, of, as unemployed um, uh, uh, on living on benefits uh, in the states, uh, uh, taking um, one or another form of pain, addicting to one or another form of painkiller or whatever the hell it may be. Mm -hmm. Useful labor is life's prime want. That is the actual situation under present day capitalism. Thirdly, uh, we have just had, uh, we had in 2008-9, a classic capitalist financial crisis resulting in uh, 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 a big uh, recession. Uh, the capitalist class got out of, the states got out of that by printing enormous amounts of money. 
uh, as soon as they began to try and uh, uh, take the uh, uh, money printing slightly, trick reduce the tap of money printing, the COVID pandemic broke out and they had to print a whole load more money. Um, the underlying problem here is uh, poverty in the midst of wealth, poverty caused by the production of wealth. Uh, declining profitability leading to intensified competition. This intensified competition, this, 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 this problem leads to uh, uh, protectionism, state protectionism, and that state protectionism includes uh, warfare. Among other things, among other things, the United States is war in Ukraine is a war to crush uh, the Russian arms industry and uh, uh, impose an American uh, monopoly of uh, the provision of arms. Among other things, the various uh, tech sanctions against China uh, are to protect uh, the United States uh, US industry against China. These are the logics which grow out of crisis. And the irrationality I referred in um, uh, Jack's in, in the chat in Jack's talk to a Wall Street Journal article by a senior um, ex NSA official arguing for the United States to plan for victory in a nuclear war. Yeah. Which was at the same time, Danny Finkelstein in The Times arguing that we need to think seriously about how to fight a nuclear war. Yeah. This irrationality. Uh, Moshe spoke to a Hopi meeting uh, 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 the other week, about the, uh, earlier in the week, about uh, the extraordinary level of irrationality of the new Israeli government, that uh, the crisis conditions produce not just um, crisis itself, but also irrationalism in government, which tends towards uh, 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 war. Mm -hmm. So that there's an urgent need, all this means, there's an urgent need uh, to break with money as a means of coordinating our human activities. Because it's money as a means of coordinating our human activities. It's the fundamental point of volume one of capital is that all the infernal machinery of capitalism is inherent in the money mechanism of the means by which we coordinate our human activities through money. It's precisely all the arguments which um, uh, 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 Hayek and von Mises and these guys made uh, that uh, money is a veil which allows us to uh, uh, coordinate without being engaging in conscious coordination with each other, but actually the money regime itself inherently implies, requires, it requires the state and state money in order to guarantee credit money. And because it requires the state in order to guarantee credit money, it requires the state as a, uh, a, 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 a competitor in geopolitics. But equally it requires uh, it inevitably produces the multiplication of credit money and uh, the uh, strivers, the guys who are trying to get on in society, bid up uh, assets which can be saved. And by the strivers bidding up assets which can be saved, we get inevitably the boom turns to bubble. It doesn't automatically self-adjust. Uh, there isn't an automatic self-adjustment. There is a necessary uh, crash element in this so that uh, 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 we need the question of going beyond money and money-like devices like uh, labor tokens yeah, is urgently posed for us uh, by uh, the nature of capitalism. I add, um, I think I referred to during um, uh, uh, Chris Knight's talk, uh, uh, as, as academic work which shows that uh, helping other people is good for depression. 
Mm -hmm. Lack of altruism, contrary to there is actually a, an American uh, book collection which argues that altruism is psychopathic. <laughs> this would be, there would be. Yeah. Uh, but it turns out that lack of altruism is, is likely to produce uh, uh, mental ill health. Equally, it's clear and a whole raft of massive stuff that radical status inequality produces physical ill health and mental ill health. So if we pursue human needs, we're going to have to pursue an uh, egalitarian society. So that means when we're looking about looking at uh, uh, the communism. Communism is a society in which the aim of the society is the maximization of uh, human well being and human potential. It's therefore a society which functions on the basis of the principle of need rather than on the basis of principle of rationing by money. It requires us to um, go beyond uh, the uh, enslavement, as Marx and Engels put it, to the division of labor. I think it's better to call it the specialization, occupation, getting beyond occupational specialization. I say getting beyond occupational specialization because the idea we could get beyond the division of labor is obviously fatuous. But when they're talking about division of labor, what they mean is some people are always architects and other people are always porters. Um, it should be said that that occupational specialization is also in itself, um, it stunts us. It doesn't stunt us in quite the same way as the kids who were sent to work in the cotton factories um, who, who developed uh, strange uh, 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 orthopedic effects from working from a very young age from in on the machines, yeah, but it stunts us. It has mental. In, in, if it's mental work, it has mental impacts. It also actually in the uh, uh, the physical work, which uh, uh, it has has similarly has orthopedic impacts and so on. Um, so the, the, the communism which we're looking for is one which involves the end of the state, the end of classes, uh, the end of uh, the sort of uh, specialization of function which results in um, uh, uh, the guy down the road from me spending his whole career life running a fish and chip shop or me spending my whole career life doing uh, legal research and uh, uh, teaching I sometimes call it training vultures uh, as, a, as a law lecturer that's a, a not improper description of my job uh, which I've just given up but in any case yeah. okay so now we've got the idea of that there are elements of communism growing up and pu being pushed forward by uh, the problems of capitalism. Mm -hmm. That the question of communism, a communist mode of organizing society, not just of uh, a socialism, whatever the hell one means by socialism, of nationalizing the forces of production, whatever the hell it is, the question of communism, of our open collective discussion, open, clear planning among ourselves, but also of uh, rotation of jobs, of um, uh, a society which aims at the maximum of human development, not at the maximization of uh, out productive output. All of these things are posed, are presently posed by uh, the development of capitalism. Then the transition. Because, as I said, the transition is a period which involves conflict and contradiction. 
It's a period which involves the interpenetration of the continued existence of capitalist production, particularly of the petty, petty, petty capitalist production by small farmers, small businesses, uh, SME. So some medium enterprises you wouldn't uh, 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 immediately uh, nationalize. Um, that transitional period is a transitional period, however, which is inevitably going to be um, uh, Mark, I think, right, Mark Mulholland in the first session, I think rightly said, it's going to be a period of fairly bare knuckle politics. Socialism is a form of class struggle. In order to have that, socialism is a form of class struggle. We need to take steps immediately in the direction of communism, insofar as we can take steps immediately in the direction of communism. Uh, but we need also uh, to have the explicit representation. This is the, 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 the fundamental error that the Bolsheviks committed in 1921, yeah. uh, was the idea that you could, by banning parties and then banning factions, you could prevent the political representation of the petty bourgeoisie. They were going to let the petty bourgeoisie loose. They were going to let the peasantry loose through the new economic policy. But in order to preserve the dictatorship of the proletariat, they were going to suppress political representation of the peasantry. Mm -hmm. Suppressing political representation of the peasantry merely had the result that the political representation of the peasantry took the form of faction, uh, a pro-peasant faction in the Communist Party. OK, so we've suppressed factions in the Communist Party. The peasantry is still represented. It's represented by obscure clique intrigues within the leadership of the party. Okay. So that you need that representation up front. And then that was part half of my polemic against Paul Cockshot, who argues that uh, uh, we should go over immediately to the abolition of elections and replacement of elections with uh, sortition and uh, juries. Yeah. The problem with this is if it's, it's one thing if the mechanism which is adopted is a mechanism which allows the transparent rep representation of classes and for classes, the class struggle to take place in an open form. But if the effect is to hide uh, the transparent re the representation of classes, then you've committed the same mistake uh, that the Bolsheviks uh, committed in uh, 1921. So I'm not going to say that everything which we've said uh, in the draft program in uh, uh, point four point three, which is largely about economic measures under the dictatorship of the proletariat, or what we've said in point five on the transition to communism. I'm not going to say it's all right, but it's it's all that it's all that we need or any of those things. But the fundamental approach uh, is the correct approach. And it has a consequence, which is a really important consequence. And that consequence is this begins now. In order to take power, we need to create a communist party. In order to create a communist party, we need to break with uh, 57 varieties. In order to break with 57 varieties, we need to actually break with managerialism and uh, equally with the idea that spontaneism, that we need to, with the transitional method, with the idea that we can uh, 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 scam the working class into taking power without, say, having a clear vision of the uh, long term future. But if we have the clear vision of the long term future, a vision of the alternative, the possibility exists at the moment, not very great, but the possibility exists that unification could have a um, snowball effect and we could get very rapidly from uh, uh, the fragmented, the world of fragmented groups uh, to a mass organization. And in a sense, actually, the Corbyn movement, it's on hand, it was utterly wasted by the uh, uh, managerialist politics and labourite politics of uh, uh, and pop frontism 
of the you know, leadership of the Corbyn movement. But on the other hand, it showed 250, 300,000 people flooding into the Labour Party in the hope that uh, 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 Corbyn's speeches uh, in the uh, leadership debates represented a real alternative. So the underlying possibility of a real alternative is absolutely real. The obstacle to a real alternative uh, is the extent to which the left clings to um, its uh, managerialist and um, its various orthodoxies of one sort and another and doesn't think about uh, offering um, an inspiring alternative. That's it. <laughs>